I've given a fair bit. Um, and like I said, you know, I just uh, revamped this last summer uh, for the Astronomical League Conference. Um, adding on some, some new cultures, some new constellations. Um, I have a personal interest in mythos. Uh, predominantly, my, my background is in, in Greek and Roman myth, um, but with an interest in astronomy, it kind of intrigued me to branch out and look at the similarities and dissimilarities um, across different cultures and how they viewed the stars um, and what stories may have come out of that. Let's see if it's all in. Okay. So, thousands of years, humankind has gazed up at the stars, um, and much like man's natural inclination for anthropomorphism, uh, cultures have found patterns in the points of light in the night sky. And these cultures uh, gave stories to the shapes they identified. They described the world around them. It guided people through their daily lives, heralded the onset of seasons, uh, directed them when to harvest, when to sow, um, provided both physical and, and a moral compass. Um, before cartography, you know, there were constellations. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, I wanted to look at cultures across various countries, regions, um, either side of the equator, so northern and southern hemisphere. Um, and I looked at the indigenous Americans uh, within the area, the tribes within the United States, uh, the Maya, the regions now in Mexico, uh, the Taino, the Caribbean, the Inca, the Nordic cultures, uh, the tribes in South America, uh, ancient Egyptian culture, uh, in astronomy of Mesopotamia, stories from India, China, Aboriginal tales from Australia, and the, the people of the Polynesian islands. And uh, to first understand how these tales may have arose from these cultures and what they saw in the night sky, I'm going to delve a little bit into how they observed. Um, so we're going to dip our toes into archaeoastronomy. Uh, so, here in what we now know as the United States, uh, we have three very prominent locations. Uh, so, what you're looking at is the Medicine Wheel, Medicine Mountain in Wyoming. These were stone and some wood alignments and markings uh, that denoted various times of the year uh, that were used by the Shoshone and Crow tribes. Um, and it was a prehistoric astronomical calendar and observatory. Uh, Woodhenge, the post placements here are uh, predominantly focusing on the solstices and equinoxes. Um, and this specific region, uh, Cahokia, uh, was the largest city and religious center for the indigenous people um, of the Mississippian culture. So they were mound builders. So there's tons of these mounds and placements within the general area. Most of you are also probably familiar with uh, Chaco Canyon and Fajada Butte, which is also home to the Sun Dagger. And the astronomical markings and petroglyphs there uh, are relative to the cardinal directions, solar um, and lunar dates, um, and were used predominantly by the Chacoan and Pueblo people. Within the region of Mexico, uh, we have also three areas. So this is specifically looking at uh, Chichen Itza, El Caracol, uh, which was an ancient Maya observatory and building. And it was uh, a way for them to get above their land and altitude um, and to be able to observe by way of the flattened landscape. Uh, so they used markers such as these to denote areas within the sky. And most of their observations were focusing on um, when to plant, so agriculture, um, harvesting, and so forth. Teotihuacan is an ancient, well-known Mesoamerican city. Um, at the time, boasted one of the largest populations in, in the world. It was actually the sixth largest city at its time with over 100,000 people. 
Um, and while the temples there, funny enough, are there's one name for the sun, the sun temple and the moon temple, um, those don't have any definitive astronomical associations. However, the city's streets were aligned with points um, along the Pleiades. Uh, and when the Pleiades was at its highest point, um, so it's possible also that there's a connection there with uh, Kitsukoto, which is the feathered serpent. Mount Alban in Oaxaca is both a fortress from a tactical perspective, but also for astronomical purposes. So it was very specifically oriented north and south with arrows that pointed to specific stars that were thought to denote uh, times to provide offerings to the gods. Funny enough, there's also a separate structure uh, that has no similar alignments to this, but it's attributed to matching shapes and orientation of the constellation Auriga, um, and possibly is attributed to um, a union between two gods. Also, I should state, um, I am barely fluent in Spanish. Um, I don't speak any other languages other than that in English. Um, so if I mispronounce something in this presentation, um, feel free to correct me later, <laughs> but I'm doing my best here. So uh, do take my pronunciations with a grain of salt. Okay, now we're going to go to the Caribbean. And I really wanted to focus um, on a lot of cultures uh, that weren't necessarily locked into uh, land like the, the larger uh, uh, continents. So you'll see some variation here. Um, in particular, their sites uh, were mild as far as the size and scope. Um, this one, Kuguana site, served various different functions. It was actually used as a sports, sporting arena. It was used for ceremonial dances and religious rituals, um, even uh, ball games that were very popular. Uh, but it was found that carved on both the petroglyphs and on the monoliths that were found there depicted specific astronomical events. Um, again, like a lot of these areas that we're looking at, predominantly noting the equinoxes and solstices within the area. And the Lucayan Arawak village has these stone lined courts or plaza um, that were also used for multiple purposes. They were very multifunctional, um, but these were uh, specific to denoting high magnitude stars in uh, transitory orbits. Um, and like most of these sites, they were used mostly for lunar or solar and then had some additional purposes. Um, at the bottom here, these megaliths at Greencastle Hill um, were assumed to be predominantly ritualistic and then were found uh, to function also for observing the night sky, solar, lunar, stellar alignments. Um, and it's also surmised that some of these stones are grouped and they resemble the constellation Sagittarius. Moving on to the Inca, I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with Machu Picchu. Um, the Inca possessed a, a tremendous knowledge for the climate, uh, for agriculture, for uh, tracking the seasons. Um, and this is very evident in the way that they conducted their lives, in the way their city was laid out, uh, which is actually in a geodesical alignment, which means that um, there are points that are astronomically aligned within the city that cover the entire celestial year. So not just specifically the eclipses, or I'm sorry, the equinoxes or the solstices, but activity throughout the whole year. Um, and the, the Inca, their, their religion was tied to astronomy. So they worshiped gods of the sun, Intil, uh, the god of the moon, Quia. And, and they saw gods in their stars, as well as in the mountains and the rivers around them. Um, but what was interesting about them, and you'll see this in a, a couple of different uh, cultures that I've looked at, where they are not only recognizing the stars of the constellations, but they also acknowledged um, and had stories and mythos around the darkness. So they were actually one of the few cultures that could identify constellations without the presence of stars, so the darkness in between the stars. In the city of Cusco, this is a great example of astronomical alignment. So this city uh, lies on radial planes. 
that mimic the sky and point to specific astronomical events on the horizon. Um, they were actually very horizon based. So they placed a lot of pillars and mountains on the hills overlooking Cusco so that when the sun rose or set between these pillars, uh, they knew they had to plant a specific type of crop um, at a specific altitude. In La Higuera at uh, La Silla, it's a complex assortment of etchings in rocks. Um, and this was surmised to show a lot of markings that pointed to the stars Canopus and Hadar. Um, and it's now currently today the site of La Silla Observatory. It's part of the European Southern Observatory. Um, and I mean, this is a site that is historic. People have been observing here uh, for at least 15, 1700 years. Moving up into Northern Europe, um, the predominant mythos in this region is going to be based on Norse mythology. Um, so like many ancient mythologies, connecting gods and their acts to deeds in cosmology. Um, mostly tales uh, that have been documented in texts like the poetic and prose era of the Viking people. Um, and mostly revolving around present day Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Germany. Uh, so we have uh, the Gothic Circle, which is located in central Germany. And this is a series of 250 ring ditches that have thought to have been solar observing. Um, it's been dubbed the, the German Stonehenge. Um, and again, marks the solstices and equinoxes by viewing them through a series of breaks in the wooden structure, sort of like a wooden slatted fence there in the middle of the screen. Uh, the Gotland grooves in the upper right hand corner, these are 3,600 grooves that have been cut into 700 boulders that litter the Gotland Island in the Baltic Sea. Um, and they're thought to have been markings, sort of sight lines for celestial phenomena. In the upper left hand corner, you have the ale stones. Um, and archaeologists have agreed that these are assembled about a thousand years ago um, and acted as both a burial monument, uh, but also as a way to determine astronomical events. Uh, they're formed by 59 large boulders that outline the shape of a ship. Um, and they are angled as such along the sunset direction of the summer solstice and with possible alignments to uh, moonrise, moonset that hint towards a potential lunar calendar. Moving over to Egypt, again, very popular display. I think uh, most of us are familiar with the role that the pyramids of Giza have played in astronomical orientation. Uh, there's a very strong mathematical computation that went into this that um, points to where they, the Earth's surface is exactly one third of the way between the equator and the North Pole and its North axis. So these pyramids are, are lined up and oriented as such. And uh, they represent the, the three stars of Orion. So the smallest of them is, is slightly offset, um, but it is supposed to be the orientation to uh, Orion and um, how it's created when viewed from, from the Nile. Uh, so the Nile plays the role of the Milky Way in the night sky and where uh, the three stars of Orion's belt is in relationship to that. Uh, then Abu Simbel is uh, in the New Valley government of southern Egypt. Um, and this temple is uh, on a biannual basis. When the light shines through, it illuminates scriptures on the wall. So this was built by Ramses II. Um, and the sun shines through on two very specific days. It was designed for this purpose um, on the king's birthday, which is February 21st, and on the day of his coronation, October 22nd. So um, that, was, that was definitely planned. <laughs> uh, there at the bottom, we have Napta Playa. And the, the stones here are aligned uh, as a seasonal calendar. It's one of the oldest known uh, megaliths in the world. It's rumored to be actually the origin of Egyptian astronomy. 
So it sports four gateways uh, that of course are structured in cardinal directions that track what the solstice and equinox is. Um, but there are also six irregularly placed stones in the center that appear to, to match up with what were once individual stars um, the accuracy of, of course, is a little off here because of stellar drift, uh, because you're looking at stones that are thought to have been placed there um, about 10,000 BCE. So just, just a little while back. Moving down to South Africa, you'll find that um, a lot of the regions that have a large predominance of different tribes will have a similar mythos or, or at least connotation behind their, their constellations. Uh, in the rock art of uh, Khoisan or the, the Bushmen, uh, the people are scattered about across South Africa. Uh, the pictorial representations range from uh, sketches and drawings of comets uh, to bull lights. So they've there's a, a strange uh, speculation uh, that this may have something to do with surrealistic experiences uh, that the shaman of the tribe experienced while in a trance state. Uh, so the Khoisan people actually associate meters and comets with trance. In Namora Tonga, in the Kalokol, uh, these pillars are aligned with seven star systems. So this is a little interesting. Um, we don't get a lot of variation aside from the, the usual bright stars. These are actually oriented towards the Triangulum, Pleiades, Bellatrix, Aldebaran, the central stars of Orion, Saif, and Sirius. And lastly, the, the dolmens of uh, Antananarivo in Madagascar. So the dolmens are single chambered structures. They've got these vertical megaliths um, and typically a horizontal capstone. And they've been found to be oriented towards sunrise and sunsets of the equinoxes and solstices. Um, and it's interesting because there are some associations with the parallels linking these dolmens to actual burial sites, interpreting the sunrise and sunsets as the passage of life through the rising and setting of the sun. <coughs> Pardon me while I take a sip of water. So with the Mesopotamians, we get into the city of Babylon. Uh, Ancient Babylon, Babylon was uh, an epicenter of astronomy and, and mathematics, and these were, were key studies to the people of the time. And we found uh, this is where scholars are starting to create maps of the constellations. Um, their astronomy was based on recording celestial objects um, and logs on Sumerian clay tablets. Uh, as you'll see there, one of the tablets is the Venus tablet of Amasodugura, which uh, <laughs> Sorry, again, pronunciation. Um, and the, the tablet actually focuses on not stars or the moon or the sun, but actually the rising times of Venus and its first and last visibility on the horizon uh, before or after sunrise. Um, and these are helical risings and settings of Venus and, and possibly in the form of, of lunar dates. These observations were actually recorded over a 21 year period. So the Babylonians were very fastidious um, about their research and about their logging. Um, and they're also the first that we're aware of to start seriously applying mathematics to their observed astronomical phenomenon. At the bottom there, you find um, Petra, uh, and it's a Nabataean structure that marks the events of the sun, moon, and the stars. Um, and it's interesting because during the winter solstice, the light of the setting sun enters through the gate and illuminates uh, these sacred mota, which is a, a podium where, where stone blocks uh, are placed to, to represent uh, divine gods. Um, so again, you know, utilizing a lot of these structures, these physical structures um, to direct light, it actually kind of reminds me of a scene out of Indiana Jones. <laughs> Moving on to India, here we have the Giyata CD and uh, the little, literal translation is 11 steps and um, it's an astronomical observatory of uh, the Emperor Humayun uh, and it was to allow you to rise up and overlook these hemispheric cavities uh, that were in the ground 
where celestial readings were taken. Um, Humayun was obsessed with astronomy and it, it manifested in unusual manners. He actually deferred a lot of um, his business based on planetary association. I found that kind of interesting. Uh, Jantar Mantar in Jaipur, Rajasthan, um, is an observatory that was designed to follow lunar and solar and celestial movement. Um, and it, it almost looks like it, it could be a museum because there are a total of 19 astronomical instruments um, that were built by the, the founder of Jaipur, King Sawal Jasin II. Um, all of the instruments are designed to take observations with the unaided eye, um, and they operate in three different systems. So ecliptic, equatorial, and what was called horizon zenith, or as we know it, alt as. Nilurulu is a, a stone, a series of megalithic monuments containing about 12 to 16 feet in height. Uh, they're arranged in a very concise pattern in rows of stones that's supposed to give a direction to sunrise and sunset uh, calendarically for important events, again, like equinoxes and solstices. Moving on to China. Um, again, a lot uh, more focus on instrumentation um, and, and very formal structure. You have Denfeng, which is an early Chinese capital, and it's considered to the Chinese the only point where astronomical calculations were accurate. Um, in Kaifeng, it's one of the seven ancient capitals of China, uh, and it's the location of the National Museum of Natural History, which houses this phenomenal astronomical clock tower. It's the image in the lower left-hand corner. Um, and then they have the Beijing Ancient Observatory, and it's a pre-telescopic observatory uh, that is home to Kaifeng's astronomical equipment um, and also provides markers for astronomical orientation. Um, I'll, I'll add a side note, in, in a lot of my research and studies, I've found uh, Chinese astronomical mythology to be one of the most fascinating because it's very structured. It's focused on um, giving a star a designation uh, based on a cardinal direction and then usually a color and then an animal. So you'll see that as we get into talking more about the, the constellations themselves. Moving on to Australia, um, another interesting anecdote with Australian astronomy is a lot of it is based on Aboriginal, what they call dream time. Um, so a lot of the mythos, the stories, they actually come from uh, what the Aboriginal believe to be the, the stories passed from the ancestors in their subconscious while they are, they're actually sleeping or meditating. Um, so Ngat Ngat is a there in South Australia. It's actually a lunar calendar that's marked out um, in these carvings in uh, the rock wall. Same with the Guring Gai Chase National Park in, uh, in Southwest um, Australia as well. And then these stone alignments you see over here in, uh, in Northern Sydney, New South Wales, those are believed to be aligned with solar uh, purposes as well. And then the, the last island grouping I'm um, have in this collection are the islands of uh, the South Pacific and the Polynesian islands. So here we have a couple of really interesting um, bits. So in Tonga, they have Ha'amunga Amoi, and it's a stone trilithon. So they're three coral limestone slabs. So this is going to be the image in your lower left-hand corner. Um, built around the 13th century as a gateway to uh, a Tonga royal compound. And it was supposed to uh, show you the position of sunrise at the solstices and equinoxes. Up on the upper right hand corner is Nanmandal, um, part of the Senyavayan Islands, uh, means the space between, uh, the spaces between. This is a ruins of a city uh, that acted as a ceremonial and political seat at the time and the portions of the city oriented towards Orion's belt um, and the southern cross which has a very important significance as asterisms for ocean navigation. 
And then up in the upper left-hand corner, we have Terura in Ritika, or Rik Itia. <laughs> uh, and this was a construct around about 1450 AD. It's a solar observing platform that again aligns with uh, the cardinal directions and was useful for observations during the solstice. So one of the things I wanted to uh, look at was, is there any correlation between the different types of structures? Uh, so for here, for example, out of the different archaeoastronomical sites that I've discussed, these are all of the locations that we're talking about that have either some kind of wheel or hinge design to them. And here we have which ones are based around a structure or a city. Um, whether or not there's a, there's a correlation, I, I'm still sort of researching that. Uh, but it's something that I wanted to be able to see if there's any way to quantify. Um, obviously, you looks like you might have some equatorial grouping here. Um, but then, of course, you have some uh, sites within the west coast of South America and in Polynesia that also have structures and cities uh, for astronomical uh, research and observation. Um, and then these are the locations of where we see petroglyphs um, and markings. So this is just if anybody was curious. Um, I've done the same actually. So you may have noticed that there was sort of a, a timeline in the lower left hand corner of those areas. I also wanted to see whether or not um, these structures had any correlation along the timeline. It's a pretty big timeline and it was a little challenging to kind of scrunch it down from, you know, about 1735 all the way back about 25,000 BCE. Um, but it did the same thing here. So you'll see here's a grouping of the wheels and hinges. If anyone happens to see a correlation in some of these, I would love to discuss it further. Same with the structures and cities. Now this is interesting with the exception of Giza and Petra, we actually see a larger concentration uh, more recently, if you can call it recently, in the timeline of these cities and structures uh, being astronomical in relation. And then noticing a pretty good smattering of, of petroglyphs and markings. So just something I was kind of curious uh, whether or not there was any, any correlation here, any patterns. So to give you an idea of where I'm looking in the night sky, I wanted to be able to look at constellations uh, that appeared all across the sky. I didn't want to concentrate too much to the northern hemisphere, too much to the southern hemisphere. So we've got a pretty good smattering we're looking at. Now, not every single culture may have a myth or a story behind the constellation that we're looking at, but you'll get a pretty good idea of the, the trends <laughs> as we go through these. So the first we're going to look at is Orion. Now this, without fail, is typically depicted as a person. So your indigenous American tribes uh, commonly referred to Orion as, as the slim one. Um, and it was an indicator of when to plant the crops. So like most of these constellations, they generally denoted uh, points in a, a suppose a calendar year. So when it was going to rain, when the now was going to flood, when was a good time to harvest and, and to sow, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the Maya view this as Hunhonapu, uh, which literal translation is uh, one lord or first father. Uh, the Caribbean uh, mythos, particularly in Antigua, uh, this was viewed as a chief Kusik, uh, who was <laughs> also viewed as a, a one-legged hunter. So I don't know if uh, the chief himself maybe only had one leg or um, a lot of these constellations may have multiple meanings uh, depending on what they were representing. Also, if this wasn't viewed as an individual or a person, attention was usually given to the three stars of Orion's belt. Uh, so for instance, the, the Inca viewed the three stars as Kinsachata, which were uh, Incan shamans, whereas uh, the Norse mythology uh, referred to the being as Urvandil, who's associated with Thor, um, and the three stars are known as Frigg's distaff, which is actually uh, 
another word for a spinning spindle. Again, a lot of these are up to interpretation and may have changed slightly as stellar drift has occurred over time. Uh, the Egyptians viewed this as the god of Cyrus. Uh, South African tribes viewed Orion's sword actually um, as a long stemmed flower, which I'm not going to bother pronouncing because I know I will completely smash it. Um, but other tribes across the region looked at the three stars and to them they were either zebra or also big tortoise. Um, in Mesopotamia, Orion uh, represented the hero Gilgamesh, and in Indian culture, it's known as uh, Prajapati, which is a Vedic deity of Hinduism, also known as the Lord of Creation, Protector. So across most of these, you have some kind of hunter, warrior representation. In, in Chinese, it's Shen, which is a great hunter, warrior. Um, in Australian cultures, uh, the three stars are actually three brothers that are sitting across uh, a canoe. So slight deviation here. Um, and the story is about fishing lore. And in Polynesian mythos, the three stars represent three sons who had similar exploits to uh, that of the demigod Maui. Now this one you may feel is a little stretch. We've got Lyra here. And in a lot of these cultures, they view the constellation as a bird. Um, and I'm wondering if it's that big bright star of Vega. Um, so for the indigenous Americans, most of them viewed Vega as the eye of God. Um, it is the fifth brightest star in our night sky. So I'm not surprised that they would give it some prominence. Um, the Maya view Lyra as the Kalkleex, which is a bird demon who uh, possesses, um, I'm sorry, so who, who poses as a sun god. Um, the Incas see it as a small silver llama called Ucachule. Don't really see it. A lot of these um, ancient myths don't exactly have pictures to go with their stories. So we kind of have to just sort of squint and uh, maybe give it a little bit of creative license. Uh, the Norse viewed this as the Dane or a deer constellation uh, with the branches of the, the world tree. So uh, I think the way it's depicted is that the two stars along its back legs, there's two stars to be the trunk, the bright star of Vega is its eye and the, the four stars around form these antlers. Again, creative license here, you know, use your creative juices. Um, getting back to the, the bird aspect, uh, the Egyptians view this as Nikhvet, which is the vulture goddess. Um, and in Australian mythos, this was called the Niloian, which is um, the name also given to Vega itself. Um, and they thought it was shaped like a malifowl, which is a type of bird. Um, then some, some significant deviation, the Mesopotamians called this uh, the, the lady of the open field or lady of the wind. Not really seeing a person in that, but again, you're also dealing with stars that may have moved a bit over time. Moving on to Ursa Major. <laughs> this one also seems to have uh, some similar stories behind it, whether it's an animal or some kind of means of uh, carting uh, or transporting things. Uh, in Norse mythology, it's referred to as uh, Karlavagen, which is the, the wagon or Odin's wagon or chariot. Um, indigenous Americans, we all know, see this as the, the great bear, uh, particularly in the, the Navajo tribes. Um, in the Maya, they see it as a bird who fell from the sky after being shot. Then it's a kind of bird, and I'm still trying to say, figure out how that uh, translates. Um, but it's interesting to say the least. Uh, the Tuareg of South Africa see it as a camel, uh, whereas other tribes in the region view it as an elephant with trunk extended. And that I can actually see with sort of the, the ladle portion, or I guess the, the arm portion of the, the ladle of the asterism, the Big Dipper, as sort of being the elephant's trunk. Um, 
in the Chinese mythos, they call it Dumu, which is the mother of the great chariot. So again, back to that sort of transportation uh, device. Um, and the Australian mythos is Baidam, which is uh, the shark constellation, predominantly with the Torres Strait people. Um, again, trying to see where that shark comes in. I think I may have to give this talk next time and when we can do it in person and, and have everybody sort of have these sheets of these constellations and they, they can draw and figure out how they think some of these constellations may shape. I'd be very uh, curious to see what everyone says. Uh, typically in the past when I've given this talk, I'll hand out um, sort of fictitious star maps and uh, while I'm speaking, allow people to sort of doodle and make their own constellation out of the image. Um, and then we sort of compare and contrast at the end. It's always an interesting uh, practice to see the, the differences and similarities between uh, what people draw. Because a lot of times I know when we're on the observing field, um, either clusters or faint fuzzies end up looking like butterflies or dragonflies or some kind of winged creature. Um, so it's a, it's a fun activity and maybe we'll try it again when we can all meet again. Moving on to Corona Borealis. This is a very clear shape. And for most of the cultures that I've researched, it's a very common trend. So in the indigenous American tribes, uh, they see this as a sweat lodge or a council of chiefs or some kind of circling up or a circle dance. The Inca view it as a circle dance as well. Um, the Norse have uh, relations to this in both being a, a circle, but also seeing it as a toe and associating with uh, Thor's toe. Interesting. Uh, the Egyptians view it as the, the crown of Lower Egypt, um, and in South Africa, uh, it's seen as Bushmen dining together. Um, and in Mesopotamia, it's again sitting gods uh, in this circle or in this crescent. Um, you know, it's, it's always with some sort of gathering in mind. Um, However, when you get into the Chinese mythos, they call it guansuo, which uh, means jail. So they actually invert it <laughs> upside down um, to look like some kind of enclosure. Um, not surprising with the Australian Aboriginal, they view it as a boomerang, while the Polynesian umben uh, see it as a fishing net of the people of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> now, wa not wanting to be completely uh, Northern Hemisphere, did want to look at Corona Borealis because there are some similarities in shape. Um, and in a lot of these, you, you start seeing, uh, again, trends. So uh, the Egyptians view Corona Australis, what they can see is sort of these bull horns or mountain bulls. Um, again, in South Africa, it's seen as a, a tribe of elders. Um, and what I also found interesting, so Mesopotamia, it's called Magur, which is the bark which I was thinking, okay, bark. I don't really see a tree, uh, but it's actually referring to a night bark or a boat or gondola. So again, you can kind of cut that with the, the shape there. Um, it's really fun when you start getting into, again, the Chinese constellations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, their constellations are built around cardinal directions and color and animals. So uh, Corona Australis is located within the Northern quadrant of the sky. So it's symbolized as the black tortoise of the north. <laughs> I always, I, I think they're very poetic in, in their naming. Uh, let's see. The Torres Strait people of Polynesia uh, see this as part of a larger constellation. So it actually ties into constellations with, within the region. Um, but specifically, uh, they're looking at this as sort of encompassing part of Sagittarius and Scorpius and Pleiades and Orion. So in some of these areas, um, you know, they're almost viewing these constellations as, uh, as we view asterism. So it's a part of a larger portion, a larger collection. Um, but it's most commonly in, in the South Pacific viewed as some kind of boat or a basket um, or a way of catching fish, so a net. Eratinus, I'm sure for you, is going to be 
obvious on so many levels. <laughs> it lives up to its name of also being a water constellation because that's primarily the nature of how it's viewed across these cultures. Uh, the people of the Caribbean see this as a flood or a water flow. Um, it's actually a little known constellation within the Norse mythology, um, obviously, because it also uh, does not, is not completely viewable for them. Um, but again, it's associated with Ran after the Norse goddess of the sea. Um, the Egyptians view it as the, the river's end in South Africa. It's uh, symbolic of, um, you know, the staple of foods. And so it lists the time of the annual flooding of the Nile and the high rivers and tributaries of Africa. Just taking a sip of water, thank you. Okay. The Australians refer to this as the constellations of the canoe stars. So again, uh, associated with water. Um, and of course, the Polynesian being, you know, uh, the people that they are traversing the waters. Um, they view it as a mythical divider of the heavens from earth or the waters in the upper to the lower. Um, so it's sort of this river division for them. So also in the Star Trek universe, the Vulcan homeworld is located in this constellation. Ooh, that's fascinating, especially considering the Vulcan homeworld is practically devoid of water. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also in the Baba verse for any David Taylor fans. What's that? Also in the Baba verse for any David Taylor fans. Oh. <laughs> So getting into Sagittarius is where we, we start to see some divergence in the, the myths. Um, for the indigenous Americans, the Skidipani tribe were regarded as a, a bear. Um, and for them, it's actually uh, denotes time for quiet reflection. So maybe this might be a time where they go on some kind of a vision quest or uh, as an opportunity to sort of reflect on, on life. Um, the Maya, call this Kawalu, which is the deity of lightning and serpents. I think that's really exciting. Um, and the Caribbean see this as the back legs of the Tupi or the Peruvian jaguar. Um, the, the Inca, again, you know, dealing with their, their balance of dark and light, um, they actually see the, the dark spots between uh, the tails of the constellations that surround it. And they, they see in this, in the, the blank space, in the, the dark voids, uh, a, a talk, which is the fox. Uh, for the Egyptians, the rising of Sagittarius is actually a sign of war. So it's a time of year when armies laid out plans for conquest of one another. Um, in Indian culture, it's known as Dahanyu, which is the bow. Again, one of those, you know, take with a grain of salt, creative license. Um, in Australia, they also look at the dark constellations, the dark spaces in between. Uh, so for them, this is a story that tells a tale of one of two drowned brothers who was canoeing the Sky River and got caught in a storm. And of course, we know it as the teapot. All right, my personal favorite, Scorpius. Um, to the indigenous Americans, they see this as a snake. They see it as a scorpion. Uh, the Maya see it as something they call Kimi, which is the death god. I'd like to know the story behind that. Uh, the, the Tupi also in the Caribbean view this as uh, the tail of a scorpion, um, but also as a four-eyed fish, which I can totally see because I can see where those four eyes come from. And actually for them, it announces the fishing season, um, announcing also the long rainy season that yields an abundance of fish. For the Inca, this was uh, a serpent changing into a condor, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and it's also viewed as a serpent in uh, Norse mythology. It's a uh, the constellation of a serpent at the foot of Yggdrasil's root, and Yggdrasil being the, the life tree or the tree of life. Um, 
the Egyptians view it as a desert scorpion. And specifically on Terry's to the South African tribes, it's uh, the fire or the finishing star. So that's their main focus. Um, and the two stars along the tail are the eyes of a lion. Interesting. Um, again, within Mesopotamian culture, they also view it as a scorpion. Um, in Australian Aboriginal myth, it is two lovers who violated tribal law in the Western desert, and it's supposed to tell a story that delivers a moral message. Interesting. And in the Polynesian mythos, the, the curving shape of the pattern of the stars represents the jawbone that Maui used to hook the bottom of the ocean and bring it up to the surface to, to create the islands. I, I just love the visual. And of course, I keep going back to the movie Moana. I'm sure some of you are, at least, okay, at least one of you. Now, crooks, again, creative license, because we're pretty much just dealing with four stars here. And there's amazing what four stars can produce. So of course, I'm guessing that a lot of these cultures have taken into consideration the lesser dimmer stars in the, the area. Um, because the, the tribes of the Caribbean call this Ambato'opo, which is the face. So apparently in that is the face. Um, and it announces for them the, the dry season. Um, it's also seen uh, within different tribes as a bird resting in a tree. Again, creative license. Uh, the Inca instead uh, use the dark voids and through that can see this serpent or this snake and viper uh, within the, the dark space between the constellations between the stars. Uh, the Egyptian mythos is that this is Heliopolis, which is one of the oldest cities of ancient Egypt. So perhaps it's marking the, the four corners of the city itself. Um, again, massive creative license here. <laughs> it's viewed uh, to the Venda in South Africa as giraffes. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> what did the Norse think about it? What's that? The Norse, mytho Norse mythology. So they're actually not going to see crooks at all because of their location. Um, so it's really not on their radar to the best of my knowledge. Um, although I'm sure just as everything else, there'd be something colorful uh, about it. Maybe it has something to do with Loki. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, to the Maori in Polynesia, this was uh, Tipunga, which is the anchor. Um, and much like the Inca, the Australians viewed the dark constellations, uh, the dark spaces in between. So for them, Crooks was the head of the emu in the sky. We're going to talk a little bit more about that emu. Uh, in a few slides. Perseus is another one of those that has some uh, room for interpretation, um, but is not as common a constellation across uh, the different cultures that I've researched. However, with the Maya and also the Caribbean tribes, they both view these as a snake or water snake or water boa. Um, to the Egyptians, it's a, a tree that is a sacred tree that Ra protected from Apophis. The Mesopotamians in uh, Babylon viewed it as the old man. I think I might be able to make that out a little bit, maybe an old man with one leg, have to see. Um, in Indian mythos, it's Parsurama, uh, which translates to Perseus, and it's a great warrior born with a battle ax in his hand. Uh, and said to have exterminated an, an entire warrior class and makes him one of the most famous of all men in India. Um, and in Chinese mythos, it's referred to as uh, the, the brave god constellation. Um, and in Polynesia, the Perseus was again not commonly recognized um, as its own constellation, but sort of uh, portions of it um, are recognized. So uh, those within the society islands call it Fayiti, which means little valley. <laughs> Moving on to Pegasus, another one of fascinating interpretation. So uh, 
The great square within Pegasus is viewed uh, within Indian mythos as the four corners of a celestial bed. Um, the, the Chinese view this as the black tortoise of the north, um, and it's, it's symbolizing uh, within the northern quadrant of the sky, it's uh, the flying horse constellation. So that makes sense, Pegasus winged horse. Uh, the Norse view it as a uh, hell wagon, which is the wagon of the dead, which is also a parallel to Odin, who was said to have possessed an eight-legged horse named Slipnir. The Caribbean tribes describe it as a grill on stilts. I'm going to totally leave that one up to y'all. Um, also, many of the indigenous American tribes see it as a moose. Again, creative juices there, or maybe uh, other creative herbs working on that one. The constellation of Centaurus uh, falls into <clears throat> one of two uh, parallels. It either identifies as a, a warrior mythos or an animal mythos. So for the Maya, it was Khan, the god of warriors, but the Caribbean tribes viewed it as the neck of a rea, which is a distant relative to an emu or an ostrich. Um, again, it guess it has a lot to do with the animals that you are surrounded with, uh, because the Inca call it uchu, let me try this again, ukukle, no, ukukle, which is a llama much easier to say a llama. Um, and the, within the constellation, Alpha and Beta Centauri make up the llama's eyes. So I can kind of get on board with that. The Nordic mythos uh, depicts it as a wolf slayer. So there's a lot of activity going on in this constellation for them. Um, and the Chinese refer to this as uh, the azure dragon of the east. Um, and there's possible uh, mythos that goes into individual stars themselves. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, I mean, I could give a whole entire talk on, on just Chinese astronomy alone, because it's, it's fascinating. And I would gladly sit down over, over coffee or beer or whatever beverage or tea um, and discuss it with anyone, because I think it's just absolutely remarkable. Um, and I mean, all of this just fascinates me in general. Gemini, you're going to see a tremendous, tremendous amount of parallels. In fact, this may be, out of all of the constellations, the constellation that has the most similarities across every single culture. And I'm guessing you all can figure out what that similarity is. Anybody want to chime in? Guess maybe brothers. Brothers is a good one. Twins. Twins is very common. Mm -hmm. um, any, any kind of relation. So across indigenous American tribes, across the Maya, across the Caribbean, across all of them, they are some form of siblings or twins. Um, in some ways, it's just sort of a, a casual mention of twins. In some ways, it's much more specific. Uh, for the Caribbean, they were the divine children, and they, uh, they were twins of joy and happiness. Um, within uh, the Norse mythology, it was Freyr and Freja, so the god and goddess. Uh, children of Neodor. In Egyptian mythos, it was uh, twins, but also lovers locked in a tight embrace. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's an either or situation. Like, were they, are they interpreted as twins and in some areas interpreted as lovers or are they twin lovers? Just That's just it. classic ancient Egypt. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't be too surprised. I'm not really that surprised. Um, in Indian mythos, uh, it's Yami and Yamas, the first woman and her twin brother. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'd love to learn more about their sort of creation myths um, and whether or not, you know, did, with this in mind, did they view woman as coming before man? Kind of interesting turn of events there, maybe, if that's the case. Um, in Chinese mythos, it's- I'm sure in some other mythos, it's the first man and his twin sister. Probably. Or, <laughs> you know, maybe this, maybe the female comes later and it's just two twin boys, you know? No, I, everybody's wrong about this. This is, this is one guy or one girl taking a selfie in a mirror. 
Uh, Ooh, it was very. actually a reflection constellation? Yeah. I mean, it's symmetrical, you know, draw a line right between them. That's mm. fascinating. Definitely much more contemporary constellations. And then, gosh, that, that could be a whole nother talk in itself, taking the constellations now and giving them a modern interpretive twist. That would be uh, interesting. So I'm going to diverge from the constellations for a minute. And I know this was supposed to be a talk on constellations, but I did want to include sort of some groupings in here. So we're gonna look at the Hyades because I love the stories that, that come out of here and how they're viewed. Because again, so many similarities. Um, usually the Hyades, and as I'll show in the next slide, the Pleiades, um, you know, the mythos are all around groupings of people. So it's for indigenous Americans there, in the Western Mono Indians, it's six husbands to complement the six wives of the Pleiades. Um, in South African cultures, uh, they're actually sandals of a husband, so multiple pairs of shoes, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, in Australian Aboriginal mythos, they're, they're roles of girls divided into two. So they have the uh, Tataka, the red, and the Tishikira, white, uh, Aranda people of South Australia. Um, and in the Polynesian culture, here's where we get a little bit of divergence. Um, they actually start seeing shapes in this. So this is actually seen as Kiheru, which is an old wooden spade, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and then in both the Inca, the Norse, the Egyptian, and the Mesopotamian cultures, you have these sort of associations with animals. So the Inca call it the boca de sapo, or the mouth of the toad. Uh, in Norse culture, it's uh, ufuls kepter, which is the mouth of the wolf. Um, so there's definitely some, some macular action going on. The Mesopotamians view it as the bull's jaw, um, and even, even the Egyptians identify it as not the whole jaw, not the left jaw, just the right jaw. Jaw. Yeah, I thought that was kind of fascinating. The Pleiades, obviously, as we were just talking, uh, these are the six wives to complement the six husbands in uh, indigenous Western monoculture. Um, the Mayas see this as something of a, a snake's tail or a rattlesnake's tail, uh, and the Caribbean culture sees it as a, a swarm of bees, which makes me wonder what they call the beehive cluster, as we call it. Uh, the, the Norse mythos is that these are Freyja's hens, uh, Freyja being the, the goddess of fertility. So it makes sense that they would be hens laying eggs and so forth. Um, in South African culture, these are the digging stars. So for them, when they see this, it's a time for hoeing the ground for the growing season. Um, also indicating that, that rain will be coming soon. Um, in India mythos, these are the six rishis uh, of the god, of the war god Skanda. And uh, rishis are sort of um, sages or, or wise, wise men. And uh, I really like this one. In, uh, in Chinese culture, it is, the, it is called Mao, the hairy head of the white tiger of the east. Very creative. Um, and the last one, which I think just has a, a phenomenal set of mythos behind it that, again, could be an entire talk in itself, is how these cultures uh, interpret the Milky Way. So many of the um, indigenous tribes uh, to what we know of as the United States see this as some type of scattering. The Milky Way is scattered cornmeal uh, across the sky for, for chickens and, and livestock. The Maya call this a dust of stars. They also view it as the cosmic monster or the road to Zilbaba. Again, it's interpreted as a road or the road of souls within the Caribbean tribes. And the Inca referred to this as the life-giving river of the heavens or Mayu. Uh, and it's actually the, the counterpart to a river in the sacred valley of the Andes. Um, and again, they are focusing on the, the dark rift, the dark river. Um, so they're looking at the, the voids in between. The Norse also review this as the road to the dead. Um, and in the Bushmen of South Africa, these are ashes of tossed roasting roots. Um, but also to the 
Hosea. It's uh, the raised bristles on the back of an angry dog. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, in Mesopotamian culture, uh, the Babylonian epic poem Enumaelis describes the Milky Way as being created from several tales of this primeval saltwater dragoness. So it's not even a dragon, it's a dragoness. I thought it was fascinating. Um, and then it goes further talking about the story of Marduk and the, the Babylonian god slaying her. Um, in Indian mythos, it's Akasanganga, hopefully I pronounced that close, the Ganges River of the Sky. Um, in Chinese mythos, they, they see this as the silvery river of heaven. So again, very, very similar trends in story, in interpretation. Um, it's the, the river in Australian mythos. So it's Woolly Party. So Woolly is hut, party is river. So it's actually um, the prospect of hunting a specific game alongside this river. So kind of staking out this, this hunting game. But my favorite of all, and I'm going to end with this, comes from the mythos of the Polynesian who call this, this is the best one ever, the long blue cloud eating shark. And with that, I thank you for your time. And I will stop sharing and turn this back over to Jim. <laughs> well, thank you, Don. That was awesome. Yeah, I've heard this a couple of times before, and it just keeps getting better and more interesting. So thanks for sharing. I've, I've never done so much head tilting and squinting. Right. Um, <laughs> well, hey, does anybody have any questions for Don? <laughs>